Hey folks, Phil Zito here and welcome to SBA TV episode number 25. And in this episode, we are going to be going through the fundamentals of BACnet. We're going to be looking at BACnet objects. We're going to talk about the BACnet object model. We're going to talk about services and then we'll talk about BTL. So there will be quite a bit. I'll be bouncing back and forth between here and the whiteboard, trying to make sure I get all of your questions as they come in. Uh, with that being said, let's take a look at the whiteboard. All right, so BACnet. BACnet is an object-oriented model. So for those of you who don't understand what an object-oriented model is, is that we have object types. The primary object type that we have in BACnet that we're mostly concerned with is called the device object. Now I'm gonna be teaching you object types. I'm gonna be teaching you about properties I'm going to be teaching you about services, and through all of this, I'm not going to talk about BACnet MSTP and BACnet IP in this video. So some of you may be like, well, I need to know MSTP. I need to know IP because I'm working with those, and those are complicated. I don't understand BBMDs, or I'm having issues with my MSTP trunks. I will tell you, though, a lot of the issues I see, especially in integration, have to do with people not understanding the BACnet object model. So at the core of the BACnet object model is this object known as a device. And within a device, we have other objects. So we may have a analog input object. We may have a trend object. We may have a analog variable object. Okay? And each object within that object, right, has properties. So the device itself has properties, and then the objects themselves have properties. So there are required properties and optional properties. And I'd be lying to t if I told you I had these memorized, but if you go and you look at the BACnet standard and read up on it, you can understand that. There's also many resources, one of which we have with our guide to BACnet on our website but there's required and optional properties. So some of the required properties that I know off the top of my head would be like object ID. That would be a required property. But optionals, you know, uh, optional properties may be description. An optional property may be unit type, etc. These are optional. That's why when you get into looking at manufacturers and their different BACnet objects, you will almost always see the right property you'll, or the required properties, but you won't always see the optional properties. So you've got a device, right? And in this device, that may be a BACnet controller, that may be a BACnet VFD, whatever, but you've got a BACnet device. And then this BACnet device has its BACnet objects, right? It has its AVs, its AIs, its AOs. There's many, many different types of objects. Now, each device and each object support what are known as services. So services are how we execute things in BACnet. So you've probably heard of the read property service. The read property is how my BACnet device will go to another BACnet device and it will read its property. You maybe have heard of the who is I am service, the discovery service. That's where a BACnet device, maybe a supervisory BACnet device, goes and discovers all of the BACnet devices on a BACnet network. And it does a who is I am. That's a broadcast service. You may have heard of the time sync service. So understanding services and the services that these objects support and these devices support is critical because if an object or a device does not support a read property or write property or things like that. Like for example, an AI does not support the write property service. It does not have a priority array, and thus it has nothing to be written to. Whereas AVs and AOs do support the write property service. So if you go and you map in, and I see this all the time with people who are brand new to BACnet, they'll go and they'll try to map in points from a BACnet chiller or a BACnet um, air handler, and they'll try to map in AI points and they'll try to go and command those, but the AI has no priority array. It does not support the right property service. And thus, you can try to command it all day long. It's never going to write. 
whereas AVs and AOs do have priority arrays. We'll talk about priority arrays a little bit later in this video. But to this point, we've talked about BACnet being an object model, object-oriented protocol, and the device is kind of our core object, although there are other objects. And under the device, we have additional objects like AIs, AVs, etc. Now, the reason why you can have only one unique ID per device, like device 1000 and device 1001, but you can have, you know, a hundred AI 100s across multiple different devices. The reason you can do that is because the AI is nested under the device. So you could have all zone temps for your VAVs be AI 100. As long as they are nested under a unique device ID. So it's kind of like private networks and subnetting where you can have multiple 192.168 dot one dot x subnets as long as they are nested individually under unique public addresses right so it's the same kind of concept here now as i mentioned we have this thing called a priority array basically what the priority array does is it's a 16-bit array and it goes from 1 to 16 and 16 being the least important, one being the most important. And when you write to the object, you can choose which priority array to write to. And what this allows us to do, like back when I was working with Allerton stuff, they would say, you know, 16 is um, like global, if I could spell global, is global, 15 is local, and then like 14 would be like programmatic. And then eight would be operator override, right? And so by having this, I could have global logic that wrote to a set point. It's like it's a global set point. And then I could have local from the local thermostat. And then maybe I have something programmatic that on a state change writes a setting. And so to this AV, I can have multiple programs multiple sequences writing to a single set point. And that's the powerful thing of BACnet, and that's also the very confusing thing of BACnet in that we have this priority array. I'm just checking to see if we have any questions. Okay, we have this priority array that enables our points to be able to intake multiple different commands. And that priority array is heavily used or should be heavily used in stateful programs. Stateful programs are ones that know like, hey, I know I'm in cooling mode, or I know I'm in heating mode, or I know I'm in free cooling mode. And based on that, I'm gonna write different points to the program. So to recap so far, we've got a device, we've got objects, and the device is an object, and we've got sub-objects under that. Objects have properties and they support services. Now there's this thing called BACnet testing laboratories and BTL pro profiles. BTL, BACnet Testing Laboratories, confirms, or uh, confirms, yeah, would be the right word, that BACnet devices match a BACnet profile. So you have like advanced application, application specific, you have building controllers, et cetera. Those are a variety of different BACnet protocols, and those BACnet protocols support different BIBs, or BACnet Interoperability Building Blocks, and those are sets of functionality. And so when you read a BTL listing and you evaluate the bibs that it supports, you're then able to understand what that device should and should not be able to do. So if you're ever going and working with, you know, a BACnet chiller or a BACnet interface card, read the BACnet, the BTL listing for its profile if it is a BTL listed device, because then you know that it's been tested for compliance to the specific sets of operational capabilities that that profile requires. So I'm gonna walk back over to the computer, take a look at what questions we got, take a sip of water. Hello to you, James Smith, as well. Uh, let's take a look over here. I'm gonna switch screens, grab some water. I know, I know this may seem like pretty dry. Folks, this whole device, um, kind of AV, AI, objects, properties, stuff like that. But you might or might not
be surprised how many people don't really understand what um, the object model is and what properties are and what services are. And by understanding that, um, when you find yourself in an integration scenario, you're going to be in a much better place because a lot of people struggle with integration, not because integration is hard, because quite honestly, integrating a BACnet device is almost as, I think the only thing that is easier is like physically interfacing to a fire alarm general signal, like general alarm with two wire 18.2, right? So um, BACnet in itself though, is not terribly difficult to integrate. So JCell, can I go over bibs in greater detail? Yes, I can. Um, lacrosse, L cross, what is backnet routing? We'll go over backnet routing, I think, on Wednesday's video when we go through um, backnet IP. That's where we'll talk through BBMDs, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, BDTs. All right, let me switch this over, transition to this. And let me bring up the BTL website. Hold on. Okay. So we should be transitioned over. We should be sharing the BTL site. We are. Okay. Let's go and look at some listings. Let's grab uh, BA. Let's grab an advanced application controller. Let's take a look at the Allerton pick statement, which is protocol information conformance sheet or implementation conformance sheet. And let's take a look at the bibs. So these are bibs right here, right? We see scheduling and we see acknowledgement. We see info. Uh, we see COV support. So let's take a look if I can get the further descriptions of these bibs. And then we can see right in the BTL listing what it does for the IO. Let me, let me see if I can without, because I can't unfortunately share the standard um, because that's copywritten. So I can't stream the standard. But uh, let's see if I can't look at um, here we go here's an example of a bib data sharing read property um, a ds dash rp dash a so it talks about read property and since it's a Right, the A device is the user of data from device B, okay? So A means it's the initiator, okay? So the A would be the initiator and a B would be the executor. So A is the device that initiates the read property service. So it, it's the one that if you're looking at a Wireshark capture, it would be initiating the read property service of the remote device. And then the dash B would be the device that is executing the read property. Now the read property, um, if I remember correctly, don't quote me on this, but if I remember correctly, it is a confirmed acknowledge with a response. So you've got to confirm the response and you've got, or you've got to confirm that you got it with an acknowledgement and you have to respond with the data. So the initiating device is going to initiate the read property, that's the dash A. And then, so if we looked at this right, we would see, um, right, DS dash RP. We see that it does A and B. And then this is read property multiple, write property, write property multiple. And we see that it does, right, A and B right here. And then we see that this is B, so it's an executor, right? And then this is an initiator and an executor. So that's kind of how you read this. So bibs are mostly for Wireshark capture to figure out what the heck I'm looking at. Has not, no, no, that's, no. 
I'm sorry that I communicated that, but that is not right. Um, what bibs are, bibs define how BACnet can execute services, how BACnet can execute capabilities. So the read property is a read property service. And this is saying that this device can initiate, meaning that if I were logged into this device, I could go and read properties. I could initiate a read of other devices, right? But I could also respond to reads from other devices. There are some BACnet devices that do not so support the initiation of reads, meaning they can only respond. So if I were trying to use this device and it could not initiate reads, and I were trying to use this device to read all of the BACnet zone temperatures of all my VAV boxes and then pull them into the controller so that I could do an average and then reset DAT on my air handler. Um, if this did not allow me to initiate, I would not be able to read that property. I would have to be dependent on a write property um, as an executor and not a initiator. I know it's a little confusing, but hopefully that makes sense. That's why I said that uh, there's so many people who have been working in our field for so long who don't understand how BACnet works. They don't really understand how the services work. And, and without that understanding, it's very hard to do effective integration. And it's really hard to evaluate whether a third party device can do what you want it to do. I used to write BACnet stacks. Unfortunately, I got to go through the fun of writing them in C and writing them in C, C Sharp um, for folks who wanted BACnet stacks built back when I was doing integration. So I got to be intimately aware of how BACnet works. I used to have all this stuff memorized, but honestly, I've, I've forgotten. Does that help, JCell? Did I confuse you more? Did I make that clear to you? I, I hope I did. Um, it's a murky topic. It's, it's not very clear. I wish I could just share um, standard 135 and show you this, but unfortunately, um, that would get me uh, probably get the video on YouTube removed for copyright claims. So uh, I'm, I, I can't do that, you know, because it's not my standard. But I, as boring as it is, if you got like a couple weekends, I would go and buy Ashray 135. It's like 1,200 pages, but it's a really good read. So how does it interoperate with another BACnet device? If the BACnet device has BIBS attribute, it will be compatible with another that has those same attributes. Yeah, um, to a point, you have to understand that um, it'll be compatible if, if it's maybe an executor and the other devices initiate, then it'll be compatible. Yeah, ASHRAE, I mean, standard 135 is so cheap. Um, It's so cheap to buy. Where where is it? What's the the latest one? It's 2020 right here. Um, last I checked, it was yeah, it's 125 bucks. And considering everything we do is backnet, um, yeah. So just go and read it. <laughs> yes, backnet is an open protocol. It's not open source. So open protocol, meaning that if you go and buy this, you can go and literally follow along and figure out how to implement BACnet in your own code stack. If you want a good code stack, by the way, um, yet another BACnet Explorer on SourceForge. Since I like working with C Sharp, it's a good C Sharp library for BACnet. If you're like feeling really, really squirrely and you want to open up uh, the solution file in C Sharp, you can go and get Visual Studio, um, whatever the free version is these days, 
and you can see it has all sorts of stuff in it. The ones I would focus on are like remote BBMD. Um, I would look at the BACnet IP. I would look at the BACnet MSTP, client server, um, COV. And then you can actually put a, um, you, when you go into Visual Studio, you can actually put a stop on one of your lines of code and you can step through and actually see in code programmatically how read writes, how COVs execute. And it's really, I mean, maybe I'm a nerd. Well, I am a nerd, but um, it's really cool to step through the code and actually see it executing and understand like, oh, this is where it's encapsulating it. This is where it's typing it. This is where it's setting it into an array. This is where it's uh, doing a while loop and looping through and just processing things. It's, it's really a cool way to look at BACnet. Now, I would never use this software on a live site. Um, this like can totally hose you, uh, this BACnet, uh, yet another BACnet Explorer, because it allows you to change all the different properties. So SourceForge JSL is um, it's a open source site where you can get you can download software and solution sets. So that's what it is. It is um, you're probably thinking of Wireshark that you can utilize for MSTP troubleshooting. It'd be nice to see a capture of how the devices communicate. Um, I don't have any captures right now on this computer. Hold on, let me see. Here, hold on a second. Give me a second. Um, I think I might be able to bring one up on our LMS. Okay. All right. Backnet boot camp. Uh, I think I have Wireshark in here. Hold on. I go through any Wireshark on this video? Um, sample Wireshark captures. Oh, I know where I do. Hold on. We've got a lot of courses. So, uh, you know, remembering what's in which one sometimes is a challenge. Pretty sure this is the one I go through Wireshark captures. Uh, I think it is. Yes, yes it is. Okay, here we go. Uh, so what am I looking at? This is unconfirmed request I am. So this is a who is I am discovery right here uh, that is being executed across BACnet MSTP. So hence the source and destination addresses right here. So you can kind of see that executing. So you see the device, and you see something kind of really cool going on here, which is right here you're seeing just the MAC addresses represented. So, so that's one. Um, Take a look, what else do we got? Do we got anything else in here? Take a look. What is this? This, I think this is also. Uh, I'm gonna give you this. Uh, if you go, I wonder if he still has them up. No, there it is. Nope. Here we go. All right. So I do not um, take any responsibility for these files. Run them through your cyber uh, software. And make sure you check them that there's no viruses. But these are a bunch of PCAPs, so a bunch of uh, Wireshark captures on different uh, BACnet runs. So feel free to go use that and you can deep dive 
into those Wireshark captures. And then uh, for those of you who are interested, where is it? This is our BACnet course that I just had open. There you go. Alrighty, what other questions can I answer for you all? Let's take a look. Those were some good ones. Okay, let me make sure I'm... Okay, do you feel comfortable with bibs now, JSL? Are we good? And uh, L Cross Jr., do you feel like uh, you got to see some stuff? I just gave you a bunch of capture files in chat, so you should be able to use those and uh, dive pretty deep. I'm going to transition us back to video. There we go. It's always concerning when you hear your kid in the other room playing with a measuring of a gigantic measuring tape. You can only imagine what chaos they are performing. All right. Any other questions? Let's see. Give you all two minutes. So once again, let's recap on what is going on. So BACnet is a object oriented model. BACnet is got devices and those devices have objects which are AIs and AVs. Um, those devices or those objects support services and properties. So JSL said, so I was told Wireshark is great for the IP side of BACnet, but once you get into MSTP side, you physically need to connect something to it to troubleshoot it. Yes, so you use a USB to RS-45 adapter um, to go and have Wireshark scan MSTP buses. Um, I will tell you though, like, here, here we go, hold on. Let's, uh, let me show you this. All right, troubleshooting boot camp. There we go. All right, so if we go all the way down to troubleshooting boot camp, which is one of our courses, when we comes to BACnet, um, there are, and we did a, a TV episode on troubleshooting, just so you know that you can go back and refer to JSL. It should be in the SBA TV playlist. I think it's like episode maybe. Uh, so BACnet MSTP troubleshooting. There are really seven things um, on an MSTP perspective. Um, and those are, you know, common serial network issues uh, that are basically like RS-485 standard issues. There's polarity. There is duplicate MAC addresses. There's baud rate mismatch issues, end of line resistor issues, and power failure issues. Those are your primary ones. And then obviously violations of the RS-485 standard, which BACnet MSTP is dependent on. Uh, when you go and you check these, you, this is going to be, if you follow the Pareto principle, which is what is that 20% that is going to be 80% of the time? That's these. So polarity. That means the wires are crossed. And so the positive voltage is on the negative. That's going to be indicated by a just abrupt stop in communication. Duplicate MAC addresses, these are going to be where your network is Christmas lighting, right? As long as the duplicate MAC address is not on the supervisory device, your trunk should still stay up, but you'll have devices as the rediscovery, um, basically the heartbeat goes out to make sure the device is still alive. Whichever device receives the token first is going to be the one that most likely gets pulled back in as alive. So you'll see that. Baud rate mismatch, as long as the baud rate on the... Uh, supervisory device is one of, is either 9600 or 
6.4, you'll still get traffic through. Um, the main issue is when the supervisory device has a much higher baud rate than everything else, and it starts creating collisions because it's issuing out a lot of the message requests. Now, that being said, you will see quite a few collisions um, when you start to have baud rate mismatches. So you'll see devices go on and off. Whereas with polarity, end of line resistor issues or power failure issues, you'll see devices going completely down. So you'll see that issue. Um, end of line resistor issue, it's usually the device after that end of line no longer communicates because the end of line basically acts as a damper for a signal. Uh, power failure, this is where you can have a slew of devices off and then further down the trunk devices are on because whatever's on that transformer is down. All of that is independent of Wireshark. Um, I will tell you, having worked on hundreds of systems, uh, I can't count on one hand how many times I've done an MSTP Wireshark capture or used an oscilloscope. Uh, it's been that rare. By following these, Right here, I've been able to resolve most of the issues. It's usually an electrical issue, a baud rate issue, or something to do with a setting, like, like um, end of line, if you got that set. All right, Josh Durston says, some systems have a way of doing an MSTP capture through a proxy device to avoid having to physically connect to a capture tool. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Some devices do support that. As he mentioned, the um, CC, which... Uh, I know exactly which company you're talking about with CC. They have the Raspberry Pi board. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but I know who you're talking about. The, the router allows this. Some Niagara Jaces can do that as well. Um, ALC routers can, etc. That being said, once you've captured this, I do not recommend analyzing MSTP captures yourself. There's stuff like Optigo Visual Backnet that you can utilize that will analyze the capture for you and basically tell you. The reality is though, with BACnet IP, it's most likely a BBMD, a BDT, or a routing issue, or a duplicate device ID issue, or maybe a port mismatch. With MSTP, it's one of these issues. Once you've figured out that out, then it's pretty easy to troubleshoot these things. Yeah, there's issues like Max Masters, there's issues like frayed wires, things like that, um, but, these are the primary ones. Alrighty. Okay, any other questions? This was good. This was really good, man. Man, we're we're like way up there in the double digits this time. That's awesome. Um so super cool to have you all here. Super excited to have you all here. Um, if there is anything we can do to make these even more valuable for you, definitely let us know on um, Wednesday at noon. We are going to be diving through BACnet uh, IP, I think it is. And then um, I'm pretty sure it's IP. And then we're going to, no, MSTP. And then um, next Monday is going to be BACnet IP. So what system, what BAS system do I feel is best for a data center, an attached office building, two engineers on shift? Um, so Weaver Maintenance, I will give you the exact same answer I've given everyone else, um, just to stay true to my answer. I recommend you buy the team, not the product. There's a lot of people who disagree with me and I say prove it, but pretty much every system is exactly the same. Their graphics may be a little different. Their functionality may be a little different. How they program their controllers may be a little bit different, but at the end of the day, they all basically do the same thing. What matters is the team that's gonna install it and the team that's gonna support you. So I would interview the company to understand how long has their team been with them? How do they manage their projects? How are they from a staffing level? Do they have customers you can talk to and ask who they've supported through an installation and service cycle? 
and then I would understand their service team. How long do have they been there? Who are they? What's their experience level? That is what I would check out. The only thing I would say, if you're looking to do data centers in office buildings, I would try to avoid the light commercial packaged units um, because those usually do not have the customizability that you'll probably want from a data center solution, especially if you're like using Modbus to pull in all the power gear. So that's how I would approach that. Weaver maintenance. Hope that helps. Amit, good morning to you as well. And Jay Sal, you're welcome. <coughs> so good questions from all of you. Did I figure out the free software that used to be on Distech? <laughs> no. Um, I, I mean, it's GFX. That's what it is. I know what the software is, but getting it, yeah. If any of you have any inroads with Disk Tech, because they don't, they're not responding to me. So, I mean, hey, that's totally fine. We'll continue to teach on whoever solution they want to provide to our students. Unfortunately, automated logic, um, Honeywell, Tritium, and EZIO have been the only ones who've wanted to work with us. Everyone else has been kind of closed off, and uh, Distech has got their own L&D group, so uh, they want you to get training through them. And uh, who knows? Maybe when we start uh, our, our workforce development solution and we start placing all these students at companies, and they know Spider, and they know Honeywell, and they know EZIO, and they know ALC Icon, but they don't know GFX, and they don't know, you know, uh, Desigo, and they don't know PCT. Maybe then the OEMs will be like, oh, hey, maybe we should work with Smart Buildings Academy and, uh, like, actually get the people who are getting hired to know our stuff because... It's not a mystery that the systems you're trained on are the ones you're going to recommend. So, especially now that we're doing a lot of owner training. But hey, whatever. It's not like we're hurting for students. So, it's not something I'm going to worry too much on. But yes, GFX is the software JSL. And then they got um, ECNet, which is their N4 tie-in. I know all I have to do is have the smart installer executable, but uh, I don't have the smart installer executable anymore because I lost that when I upgraded my computer. So, uh, unfortunately, I have no way of getting that back because they went and uh, hit it to where now you have to be a partner to get Software Center. So, it is what it is. Yeah. There is actually free software out there, JSL. If you reach out to, um, who is that company with Sedona? Um, Oh my gosh, the one guy mentioned them from their router. Oh, I can picture them. I've talked to them at AHR. I know who they are. They're here in the Midwest. I, I just can't remember them. Contemporary Controls. Contemporary Controls has a Raspberry Pi board that's relatively inexpensive, and they have free Sedona software that you can program on. So that's what I would do, JSL. But yeah, Distech, so we actually, funny enough, we created a GFX programming course. We created a programming course. So we have a Niagara programming course, an automated logic programming course. Um, automated logic has given us their software with us only, uh, but we're only allowed to sell it to dealers and branches um, as far as the programming course. But we created a GFX programming course because a lot of our students were asking for that. And we went and tried to market it. 
And then we basically got told that like, hey, you can't communicate that you have a GFX programming course because GFX is our name. And I'm like, well, how else am I supposed to describe it? We have a programming course that uh, teaches a software that rhymes with GFX. I mean, like, how am I supposed to communicate? And that's what's so back ass words about our industry. And it's so freaking stupid, our industry. Because could you imagine Microsoft or Java or Linux or AWS or any of those people going and being like, you can't teach people how to use Azure because you're using the name Azure. No, they don't give a shit. All they care about is getting more people to use their products. And I will argue that Azure, AWS, all those solutions are way more complex than building automation. So that argument you'll get from OEMs of we're the only ones who can teach it because our stuff's so complex and we want people to really understand what they're doing, that's a load of horse shit. So the reality is that what's going on is we have this backwards mentality where the OEMs are the only people who can teach and that's really holding back our industry from an educational perspective. So, um, yeah, that's my two cents on the topic. Take it for what you will. You, you can get an idea that I'm a little bit passionate about that. Can I speak about what happened at Microsoft through their Exchange server? Uh, what, did something happen at Microsoft through their Exchange server? Let's take a look. Microsoft, Microsoft Hack 2021. Thousands of Microsoft customers may have been victims of a hack tied to China. Uh, I'm not part of the New York Times. I am at least 30,000. Is this what you're talking about? Fred showed a back door into the BBMD. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, you know, not too big of a deal. BBMDs are BBMDs. At least 30,000 organizations across the U.S. had a significant number have been hacked by unusual Chinese espionage that's stealing email from victim organizations. Microsoft Exchange Server email software. Thank God I don't use Exchange Server. That's the thing. Oh my gosh. So don't get me started on BACnet SC and why it's a bad idea and how things like this are one of the reasons why. Because I hope all you contractors have cybersecurity insurance because as soon as someone hacks into your customer's buildings because of your BACnet Secure BAS... Well, guess what? You're going to be liable for that. So good luck with that. Tell me how that works. Um, that's just such a horrible idea. Let me take a look here. At these shenanigans. All right. So Microsoft released some security updates. Stepped up attacks on Exchange servers. Each instance, they left behind a web shell, easy to use password protecting hacking tool, and seized hundreds of thousands of Microsoft Exchange servers. Hmm. Oh, excuse me, got hiccups. <coughs> this is just going to continue to happen. I mean, it's just the world we live in. This is why if you're going to put your system on a public facing network, you got to patch it. You got to be constantly patching. You got to constantly be paying attention. This is why I think SC is a bad idea because SC wraps all of these technologies into a single firmware and customers are going to install that firmware, but they're not going to patch it when the OEMs aren't going to roll out the patch fast enough. How can it be their fault if you don't do the Exchange Server update on your own machine? And how can it be their fault? Yes, there's 
some force in going on, but not. So therein lies the rub, right? How is it their fault? With Microsoft, most likely it's not. They probably got an army of lawyers that go and say, hey, if you don't patch your stuff, then you void uh, your our culpability or whatever. I'm not a lawyer, so. Yeah, there's so much news going on. Alrighty. What else can I answer for you all? We went a little bit off back net, but it's okay. I started it. I'm the one who started ranting, so it's my fault for leading us down this rabbit hole. Okay. All right. Well, that being said, not seeing any other questions, so we'll call it a night. Um, for those of you... Okay, I feel like I got one more question back to back net. Sure, go ahead. Let's see what it is. And while I do that, for those of you who are interested in the troubleshooting boot camp, I would highly recommend the troubleshooting boot camp. It's a freaking amazing course. You have an array which has two MSTP lines going off of it. One line goes from Mac 1 to Mac 3 to Mac 4, blah, 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 to end of line. I have an array which has two M You mean a supervisory device? Because remember, BACnet is a daisy chain. You have one more line coming off that same MSTP, and now that MAC address is 7 as an end of line. Should I remove the end of line around 5? Uh, I would have to see this. Um, let me see if I can draw out what you're saying. Hold on here. Let's do some transitioning. Okay. So we got a supervisory device right here. And we got something. One, two, three, four, five, EOL. And then uh, we got MAC address is seven. So then you got this, which would be like six, seven, EOL. Is that right? Am I understanding what you're saying here? That look right? I mean, your supervisory device should have its own MAC address or your VLX. So it's a act, it's an advanced application controller. I'm going to lower my desk down and sit down. Oh, man. Does that look right? Okay. Uh, so that's exactly how it should be, right? Should be end of line on one side, end of line on another side. That's how we want to do it. We want to have an end of line on one side, end of line on the other, and that's it. There should be no end of lines here. This super, this advanced application controller, which is your VLX, is just another controller on the bus. So it needs to have a unique MAC address as well. So that makes sense. All right. Good stuff. 
Man, I wish they would fix this latency with YouTube. It takes forever. It's like a 20 second delay. All right. Good stuff. Alrighty then. Well, good stuff. Let's call it a night. I'm gonna let everyone get to bed. I'm no, I'm gonna go to bed. But this was fun. The best thing you can do to help the channel is subscribe, hit the notification bell, hit a comment, and share this stream to your friends. That will help spread it, that will help grow it. I'd really appreciate it. We're trying to deliver tremendously great free value to you and uh, if you could do that little favor for us that helps the algorithms and helps spread the channel so thank you so much i look forward to seeing you all on a future episode thanks a ton and take care